welcome to the Lizelle Wellbeing Show. I am Lizelle and I will be speaking with leading experts and familiar faces from the world of well-being to bring you wellness wisdom you can trust. From fitness to gut health, mood to menopause, you will quickly learn how to spot a gem of wellness wisdom from just a passing fad. Now, I have had the pleasure just now of chatting with Dr. Zoe Williams, and Zoe is a practicing NHS GP, but is perhaps best known for her role on the sofa as the medic at ITVs this morning. She is super fit, and on top of her medical career, Zoe has somehow found the time to squeeze in being a gladiator on Sky One's rerun of the popular series, and also to play rugby at a premiership level. We chatted about why it's never too late to get fit, even for those of us who've had an exercise intolerance for much of our life. And in addition to her work on ITV, Zoe has also presented a number of documentaries for the BBC, including The Contraceptive Pill, How Safe Is It? Now, this is a highly controversial topic that we take a deep dive into later in the episode. Spoiler alert, the pill is much safer than we have been led to believe. Zoe is a true well-being warrior, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on all of this on today's episode over on Instagram after the show. Don't forget, if you'd like to watch Zoe and I chatting, you can also find this interview on the Lizal Wellbeing YouTube channel. Do take a look. But without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Zoe, I'm so thrilled you're here. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, it's been great because I have to say I've been slightly stalking you on Instagram, which I just love, (laughs) all your fitness and stuff. And we both do a bit on this morning. You do a lot more than me, obviously, but I don't think we've ever been in the studios together. No, no, but hopefully we will be more. Well, maybe we will, so I shall watch out (laughs) for you there. But thank you for coming to this little studio. I'd love to know, first off, really, how you got into doing what you're doing because you are just seen as such a... Success story in terms of medicine, fitness, TV, there are so many strings to your bow. Where did it all start? Um, Well, I mean, I first decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was three years old. That's Um, very focused. Yes, very focused. There have been many times from now up until me actually achieving that, that there were times when perhaps that wasn't going to happen. Um, But if I go back a bit about my background, so I grew up in Burnley in the northwest and um, we were proper true working class family. My parents separate when I was quite young, so single parent benefits that type of that type of life, and um, and we were one of only two mixed race families as well. So there was my family, one other family. Um, I had really bad asthma, so you know it started. Gosh. It wasn't it wasn't Not always ideal. an easy ride, <laughs> um, but. But yeah, I decided at the age of three that I wanted to be a doctor. My Jamaican grandma was a midwife and she bought me this little like nurse's outfit and the the kids' medical kit. Um, And I put it on and I loved it. And every time someone came to the house, I wanted to check their ears. And uh, (laughs) and she said sort of really proudly, when you grow up, are you going to be a midwife like me? And I said, Mm. nope. Um, So my mum said, oh, maybe Zoe's going to be a nurse. And I stamped my feet and said, no, I'm going to be a doctor. And and that was my mind made up, really. That was yeah. all I ever wanted to do was was be a doctor. So you did. You went to med school? Eventually. Right. Um, so, yeah, I did my GCSEs. Things kind of went wrong in life, which I won't go into, mm. but life got turned a bit upside down when I was doing my A-levels. Um, so didn't get the grades for medical school. So that yeah. resulted in me taking three years out. Um, but you lived in, up. lived in Spain for a bit, worked as a landscape gardener, did all sorts, but then went to Newcastle University to study biomedical sciences as a mm. mature student. And there was this incredible opportunity that came up where the lecturer said, we're the first university to ever do this. It's the first time we've ever done it. We don't know if we'll do it again, but we, rec- we recognise that on the combined biomedical sciences courses, it was about 300 of you, that some of you wanted to be doctors, but you haven't haven't got the grades or didn't pass the interview. So we're going to allow up to six of you to go back into first year next year to study medicine. Um, in, order, in order to do that, you had to get a first in all eight uh, modules over the two semesters, do an essay oh application goodness. and an interview. And I was the only one that the made it through. The only one out of 300. Yeah. That's so, amazing. So that's how I got to do medicine. So Congrats. it was a kind of a convoluted path, yeah. but I got there in the end. Brilliant. And medicine, how long is it now? How long is the med school training? So the medical degree course is five years, mm. um, a minimum of five years. 
there's the option of adding on a year to do um a, usually a bachelor of science so to do a, a separate undergraduate degree course mm -hmm. so a lot of people in fact i think in london mostly they do do the six years unless they've already got a degree beforehand right but yeah so it's five years yeah and then did you always think you would be a gp um Kind of, but I wasn't sure. So when I was at medical school, and most GPs don't think they're going to be GPs, but they end up falling into it or actually realising mm. that for for our lives, it's, sometimes it's the better option. Yeah. Um, I think deep down I probably did. Um, but what was funny is I used to have this almost a bit of a fantasy idea about what my working week would be like. And I didn't believe any of this would happen, but... Um, I used to say, right, what I'll do, I was in Newcastle at the time, what I'll do is I'll be a GP in Newcastle. My working GP days will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then on a Thursday, I'll travel down to London and have the day off. On a Friday, I'll go on this morning and be on the sofa. This with, was I think your it was, dream, was this, it? This is You're what I used to say. You're very good at acting out your dreams, aren't you, <laughs> and making them come true. Is this kind of creative visualisation? You channel that energy. Well, that, that's the thing, and I kind of do believe now in this, you know, visualisation and, and making it happen. Make it happen. Um, so, yeah, I used to say that would be my Friday. Then on a Saturday, I'll have my second day off and hang out in London. And then on Sunday, I'll do the Sunday surgery on Radio 1, which used to be on. I used to love listening to that. And travel back and now it's kind of yeah I look back now and think well yeah it's kind Prophetic of prophetic stuff kind of happened so ish. in between all of this you had an, another string to your bow which was being a gladiator yes on um, amazon that was the sky one gladiator yeah so How the that sky happen? one revival <laughs> um okay so the story on that one is um sky one brought back gladiators and i didn't do the first series and I remember tuning in to watch the first episode of the first series as a child of the 90s who'd grown up watching yeah, the original. Yeah, old original series. Yeah. And being to totally obsessed with it. And I was with a bunch of friends who were also junior doctors at the time. I'll never forget, we were at my friend Anna's house. We'd had a barbecue and we had this water slide outside. I'll never forget <laughs> it. I was like, oh, come on, let's go inside, let's go inside. Gladiators, Gladiators is about to start. And um, being geeky medics, we all sort of gave ourselves gladiator names that were drug names. So I think I was metronidazole. <laughs> <laughs> what does that do? It's an antibiotic. Um, <laughs> one was diltiazem. And my friend Anna, she's like, no, 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 no. The best drug ever to be invented. Mm. It saved more lives than anything. She's like, penicillin. And okay, uh, we watched- That's a good one. That's a good one. So we watched, we watched this show. And then at the end of the series, they said, we're looking for contestants for next year. And, um, and it was my friend, Shawzy, Joe, rang up and said, they're looking for contestants for next year. You've got to apply. And I was two years out of medical school. Mm. Um, and I said, I can't do that. You know, it's I've got a serious, proper job now. I'm a doctor. Yes. And he said, how much is your student loan? Ooh. I was like, it's about 40 grand. He said, well, mm. if you win gladiators, which you probably will, you'll win 10 grand. I was like, mm, OK, okay that could yeah, be quite handy. Incentive. Um, so I applied to be a contestant, went to the audition, and they asked me to come back the following week when they were doing um, an audition for New Gladiators. Mm. And then three months later, they rang up and said, we want you to be our New Gladiator. Oh my goodness, that's and amazing. That? And how much time did that take? And did you do masses of training? So I was playing rugby at the time. Which As you is, do, obviously, uh, just, just drop that into conversation. What do you mean you were playing rugby? <laughs> so Serious I don't, rugby. Yeah, 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 proper, proper rugby. Um, so throughout school, I've always loved exercise and sport and physical activity. So often played whatever I got the opportunity to play. So at school, it was netball and hockey and athletics. And when I got to uni, I actually joined the netball team initially. And um, our first, I think it must've been our first game, all the sports teams, they all go out afterwards. And we were in the university bar and I was with the netball girls and we were being ladylike and we were sipping wine. Mm -hmm. And this bunch of girls came like barging in, dressed in fancy dress as, as Lara Croft, doing commando roles and down in pints of lager. And I was just like, <gasps> I'm in the wrong team. Who are they? <laughs> and that's it, I switched to rugby. Did you? And, and kind of found that of all the sports that I'd done previously, this combined my skills, ball handling skills, mm. running. I was always sort of yeah. fast, but not quite fast enough to go beyond county level. Um, and I just loved it. I loved the game, loved the banter, loved the physicality of it. And great training to be a gladiator. 
exactly. So then when the when the opportunity came about, that was why I guess I had the strength and yeah. the power and the speed. Um, and yeah, so they made me a gladiator. And then it's, it's interesting, people always say they must have trained you really hard to get you strong and fit. Mm. Whereas actually, we all went into it already conditioned. And if anything, over the three months that we were filming, if anything, you deconditioned because there isn't the time to, yeah. to do our normal schedule of training. So yeah, so as, as the series goes on, you actually see the girls getting ever so slightly larger and the boys getting ever so slightly softer. That's really? the gladiator. And then how did it end up after the three months? So we did three months and then that was it. That was the end of the series. Mm. Um, and because of the way that medical training works, it didn't really make sense for me to take anything less than a full year off. So, so then I had nine months left and um, Originally, I was going to go and work in A&E and do locum shifts as a junior doctor. But because the job I was due to do next when I took the time out was A&E, the A&E consultant said, no, it wouldn't have me. So I thought, well, fair enough. Well, what else can I do? I've got, I'm going to be a doctor forever. Yes. It's what I've always wanted to do. It's what I'll always do. I've got a nine month window of opportunity here to do something else. So I set up a fitness boot camp in the local park in Newcastle with my friend Spencer Davey, who was a rugby player. And um, I started going to schools to talk to teenage mm -hmm. girls in particular about physical yeah. activity and health and how, for me, it's been such an important, important part of my development mm -hmm. and um, just an opportunity to share that with, mm -hmm. with other young people. Do you, when you do that, and, and I know that you're still very much involved with that, do you touch on mental health as well as physical health through exercise? Yeah. Absolutely. I think the thing, especially the groups of children that we work with now, um, we've found ourselves constantly striving to work with the young people that can benefit the most. Um, so currently we're working up in Birmingham doing a project with children who are in a pupil referral unit have been excluded. Right. And, um, and it's all about mental health. Like really, the physical activity is the vehicle for change. So physical activity is something that young people are happy to talk about and mostly happy to participate in and mm. it doesn't have any stigma attached to it it's a really positive thing yeah and that kind of gives us a vehicle and an opportunity to work with these young people and address the the more underlying issues that may be holding them back from succeeding and, and it's all about mental health it's all about self-esteem yeah. confidence and I think with this group of children in particular, they're, they're amazing kids, they're so cool. Um, they've got so much to offer, but they've almost been sidelined and put into this space where they've been labeled as, as bad or naughty. And, yeah. and when we go in there and the way we work uh, Fit for Life, what we tend to do is we deliver these programs by co-creating the programs with the young people. We do, we're not another organisation who goes in with a great offer of physical activity and this is what we're going to do. We go in and we say, what do you want to do? How can we facilitate and how can we help you identify what's going to be useful for you and how can we make that happen? Um, and yeah. So are you teaching them sports or are you just getting them out running? How, how does it work practically? So at the moment, with this, every project's different depending on what the need is, um, how it's funded, and mostly because it is co-created, so we work with them. So this project's 12 months. We work with the young people every Tuesday afternoon. Um, it's not us going in every week, but we work with Sport Birmingham, who are our delivery partners, and they have mentors um, who mentor the young people. So they do some form of physical activity every Tuesday afternoon, which is sandwiched at either end by other activities or sessions that, that incorporate things like journaling, which you which you mentioned, yes, yeah. um, breathing techniques. Um, with the girls, we've done looking at crystals and crystal healing and, you know, just sim simple yeah. things. Like one of our mentors is really into crystals, so she took a load of crystals along and she asked them to choose whichever one they just felt drawn mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm and then explained what that crystal meant and then they could change if they wanted to. And then use this technique where you use threads to wrap the crystal into a cradle and then you can make it into a necklace or a, an anklet. And it's right. just such That's, a soothing. Yeah, and, yeah, mindful, just creativity, yeah. bringing something different. Yeah. And do you find that particularly in terms of lowering rates of aggression, you know, being able to express yourself physically, you know, to, to reach out in some way or exert yourself? 
Does that help? Are there studies to show that? I mean, physical activity in terms of, um, I guess, the psych, try and keep it scientific. And this is where I can tend yes. to go off on a tangent and okay. think, of course it does. Um, what does the evidence say? I'm not completely aware that there is evidence that directly links aggression to physical activity. It kind of makes sense. And I think with common sense, we know that sort of being able to if vent. you're venting yeah. and you're able to get that aggression out and you're able to use up the, the tension that's built up in your body, then it's yes. a good thing. Um, but what we do know is with, with young people, especially young people who are already starting from from a step further back mm. that it has been proven that physical activity can help improve concentration can help mm. improve behavior can help yeah. improve and also the wider benefits of teaching and incorporating discipline into your everyday life but i think the biggest thing for us it's about the confidence yeah. and the self-esteem and the worth and the success that's showing that they can make successes of things mm. and how that can then transcend into into other parts of their life yeah Really interesting. I'm I'm a relatively new convert to running, okay. and I thought I would really really hate it. And I always used to say to the guy who um, does gym sessions with me, Michael Gary, you know, I I hate running. I'm never going to run. And he would just be like, okay, okay, you know. And then eventually, of course, he got me outside, and now I absolutely love it. I and mean, I don't run a lot. I mean, I'll do a little bit. Yeah. Um, I what do you love about done. it? Well, I think. I love the fact that I can do it any time, any place. I don't need any equipment. And I love the fact that it gets me out. And I think there's a huge connection with being outside, literally in the outdoors. It's a switch off time. I don't really, I mean, I do process stuff when I run because I, I don't listen to music, certainly if I'm outdoors. I do if I'm on a treadmill inside, but outdoors, I tend to be just taking in everything that's outside, looking at the changing the seasons, noticing the birds, the clouds in the sky, um, you know, the falling leaves, just how the, the air feels on my skin. You know, there's so many really simple things that you become mm -hmm. aware of, that mm -hmm. kind of sensory. And I, I I, think I'm quite competitive, probably, although I'm not sporty. I mean, I hugely admire people like you that can go out and be part of a team and, you know, win things, because that's not where I'm coming from at all. So for me, it's about my own personal best. Mm. And particularly if I start timing myself, saying that you know I've oh I was four seconds faster today than I was two days ago you know so you can you can a sense have of that. achievement that yeah, you it get is. That, yeah. that you feel that you're doing something that mm -hmm. you're you're progressing and I you know to be honest I've seen my body shape change as well and I think as you know I'm in my 50s and I think I'm fitter and in better shape literally yeah. in my 50s than I was in my 40s yeah and I think that's very empowering and I mean a lot of the work that I do is our well-being is trying to pass that message on yeah to say it's it's never too late and you never can make late. a difference. I mean, you must have seen that too with your older patients. Yeah, and, and we know that, the science tells us that actually, the older you are when you start, the quicker and the more significant the benefits will be. Well, that's really because, encouraging. <laughs> yeah, actually I was with a friend last night, my friend Eddie, she's called Eddie Brocklesby. She's 76 and she started running in her 50s. Did she? And she currently does Ironman triathlons no way at 76 so she's doing the next one she'll be doing next year she'll be 77 when she does the one in I'm Austria I'm gonna look her up that's amazing she's the most Gosh, incredible she's woman she goes and oh yeah she goes all over the world yeah really um, so she runs with her with her grandsons now she used to do it with her son <laughs> but her son's that? retired from Ironman <laughs> triathlons so now she does it with her grandson that is fantastic she's the most inspirational woman and it's interesting because she said she was never sporty. Um, she was in her 50s when she went to see a friend do a half marathon. She said to her husband, I think I'm going to do a half marathon. And he said, I don't think you'll be able to do that. So it was to prove him wrong. And then yes. sadly he passed away. And it was the running and the running community that got yeah. her through that time. So, you know, she started running in her 50s and mm. now she competes in design man triathlon. So, so 50s is still young. It's perfect yeah. age to start. If well, I also already. read something really scary that I think by our late 50s, we start to lose our muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you've got to use them or lose them. It's and it's once they're gone, that's... It's, before, it's much earlier than that, actually. It's about 35. No way. So in your 30s, you start to lose muscle mass naturally. And from the age, I think from the age of 60, that accelerates to at least 1% yes. a year that you, you lose unless you do something to, unless to combat you do that. Something. So you can imagine that if, you know, if you're 59, 60, if you're mm. losing 1% a year, by the time you're, you know, 80, mm -hmm. you've lost 20%. Mm -hmm. 
that's really significant unless really you significant. start doing something and how much do we have to do in order to retain it um, not as much as you might think. You don't have to do that don't much. Don't have to go into Iron Man. No. <laughs> That's <laughs> Definitely. All right then. Definitely not. Well, the, the government recommendations when it comes to physical activity, which is sufficient actually for most of us to mm. maintain a reasonable level of muscle mass, would be 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. That's so what does that mean, moderate intensity? So moderate intensity means your body feels warmer, your heart's beating faster, and you're a little bit out of breath, but able to have a conversation. So fast walking, for example? For most people who are generally fit and healthy, brisk walking, mm -hmm. cycling... Um, but then, you know, it depends on your baseline fitness. Right. So for somebody who is very fit, it might be a light jog. For somebody mm. who is is not fit at all, it could even be just a gentle walk. So, mm -hmm. um, so 150 minutes a week of that minimum, but also muscle strengthening activities on two days of the week. Um, that doesn't need to be in a gym, doesn't need any equipment. No. I do mine at home in the bedroom. Absolutely. A few push-ups, some That's tricep it. dips, a few squats. Exactly. I've got a few little dumbbell weights, not particularly heavy, but I just move them about a bit. <laughs> and and even normal daily activities, if it, if you feel mm. your muscles, not soreness as such, but actually you feel that ache in your muscles, yeah. then you're doing enough to call it muscle strengthening. So it can be carrying heavy mm. shopping bags, sure. gardening, yeah. playing with grandkids and lifting them around. You know, yeah. they make perfect weights. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Anything that may, you can feel in your muscles, even if you're on, if you're in London and you're on the tube, and if you choose to walk up those huge escalators, yes, rather than stand by the top, your legs, yeah, you are feel it in your thighs. Burning. And I, I walk around London quite a lot, and I have a backpack now, and I found that's quite good. Uh, and even I just put sometimes just put you know bottles and tins and things in there if it's empty. If I'm yeah. just walking around because yeah. I know I've got the extra weight. Exactly. And it people wear weighted difference. jackets. And I remember I did an interview not that long ago with the lovely Lauren Cuthbertson, who's a prima ballerina at the Royal Ballet. And she was saying that she walks around London with wearing ankle weights under oh, her really? sweatpants. Okay. Yeah. And she just to keep her legs always. I mean, she's obviously like a top athlete. Yeah. Um, but it just keeps her muscles fit I guess and I think this is these are the sort of hacks when it comes to physical activity yeah, I like that yeah. that it's how can you make what you're doing already count towards yeah just sneak it in being active wear some ankle weights wear some down. ankle weights and just you know <laughs> yeah. choosing the sometimes it means choosing the slightly more difficult option as human beings we're mm. we're preset we're rewired to take the easiest option and you yeah. know if you're in a busy super shopping mall and you want to get to Marks and Spencer's and it's there and there's an escalator, there's an escalator or somewhere there's the some stairs, stairs but you don't know where yeah. they are you're going to take the escalator yeah. but if it's things that you do every day or so say for example it's how you get to work or you live in a third floor flat it's whether you use the yeah. stairs or the lift if you can try and just make that a habit so that mm. it becomes the thing you automatically do you're choosing yeah. a slightly more difficult option those things add up and over the course of a year 10 sure. years 20 years the cumulative effect is really significant yeah. i was told you know if you go to the supermarket if you drive and park don't park as close as you can to the exit you know or the, the entrance to the supermarket park as far as you way as you can because then when you're walking back and you know and unload your bags from the trolley so that you're carrying them you know tiny little hacks like this yeah. but as you say if you're doing that every week it makes such a difference it is going to make a difference yeah. isn't it so rather than thinking about choosing thinking about it would be convenient to park as close to the door as possible. You could think it would be mm. convenient to park in a space where I've got two spaces at the either side of me so that I don't have to worry about the doors and I've got loads of space. Think yeah. If you can change your mindset to yeah. that's what's more convenient because the walking's fine, yeah. then you can, yeah, you add that up over the course of a lifetime, those extra steps. Yeah, makes and a it big becomes difference. relevant. Now, you still work as a GP. Yes. That's your day job. Uh-huh. And you're working in South London. Yeah. And so you're doing that most of the time, would you say, in between your media work? So I so I actually have eight different roles. Okay, only um, eight. Only eight. Mm. Um, well, <laughs> there are others that are debatable as to whether you can call them role if they're only sort of one, two hours a month, can you count them? But actually it's probably more. Um, so my GP work is two days a week. Mm -hmm. um, so every Monday is my solid GP day. So I start the week with what's most important and then my other day is kind of flexible. Um, and then I work with Public Health England, the Royal College of GPs and Southwark CCG and they're all leadership roles around lifestyle medicine. So mm. as a GP, what I'm really interested in is, is lifestyle medicine, sort of bringing it back to 
the root cause of disease. You know, why does per, why is this person ill in the first place? Well, yeah. Because they have a poor diet. Well, why do they have a poor diet? Because they can't access healthy food, and why can't they access healthy food, and so on. Yeah. Um, and then within that, physical activity is the thing that I kind of, I guess, major in. I'm, I'm an expert in. Mm. So in order to have an impact, um, sometimes it requires going sort of further backstream in whether it's the education chain for healthcare professionals. So I've been involved from the start in um, a program of work by Public Health England called the Clinical Champions Program. And it started with me five years ago, teaching GPs about physical activity, the science, the statistics, mm. how to incorporate advice in your clinical yeah. consultations. Um, and now collectively as a group, we've got lots of clinical champions spread across the country. And we've trained about 25,000 healthcare professionals this one hour package wow. um so things like that kind of mm. and are you trying to get difference. gps to kind of prescribe exercise then yeah exactly and because people want to come in and just get a pill don't they and go away again do you find or, well, not? or are they receptive to the I idea i think we often say that and i think we sometimes assume that but actually i don't think that's true it depends how you bring up the topic and i think one of the things that's so beautiful about physical activity is we're not saying to stop something or give something up. So, you know, quit smoking. I know yeah. you love smoking, but you must quit smoking. Yeah. I know you love eating this delicious high fat, high sugar food, but you yeah. know, it's starting to affect your health negatively. Um, I know you love to get drunk with your mates and binge drink, but it's really bad for your liver and bad for your health. Whereas with physical activity, you don't have to give anything up or stop anything. You add it in. You add it in. I love in the way that, that message. That's my message too. Adding yeah. in the positives. Adding in the positives. Because I like mm. to do that when I talk about nutrition as well. Like, let's mm. just add in vegetables and see how that goes. Yeah. And not focus on removing yeah. anything. Um, so that's the beauty of physical activity. So the Public Health England stuff has been amazing. Um, the RCGP, the Royal College of GPs. I've got a three-year-old with them, half a day Great. a week. And that's about mostly changing the social norms in primary care so if you go to see a GP everyone sat down all day long the receptionists are the GPs are <laughs> you're told to sit in the waiting room yeah. it's like well that's exactly the message we shouldn't be giving Ooh, so, so you're going to have everybody running around in trainers and tracksuits yeah so I, I know Literally. where I, I know where active wear to work Do have you? been for six months um and it's, it's something I just but that's a great subliminal message. You go and see your GP and they're wearing trainers and a tracksuit and it's like, right, okay. Exactly. How are we going to get you well? Exactly. So it kind of, the first time it was kind of by accident. I was the on-call doctor. Right. When you're on-call, it's mostly telephone calls. You may see one or two patients. Um, and on that day, I had to do a home visit. So I thought, I'm not going to get changed out of my trainers to do a home visit. I'm just going to jog there. <laughs> And then at the very end of the day, I had one patient. I thought, I'm not yeah. going to get changed just yeah. to see one patient. I'll just explain why I'm wearing what I'm wearing. And I explained to them and they were looked at me. All oh, right, OK. They weren't interested, you know. They're yeah. not, they don't care what I'm wearing no. as long as I do my job well. And then when I asked them what they thought about it, they kind of said, oh, I think it's good, actually. That's so great. Yeah. I love it when necessity is like the mother of invention. Yeah. And it creates something that's actually really positive. So I just thought I'm going to just keep doing yeah. it and we'll see what happens. And um, one or two members of staff have kind of looked me up and down a little bit as I've walked past. But apart from that, there have been no negatives, mm. no complaints. And um, and I was almost very naughty because I was having my appraisal with one of the senior partners at the practice, the most senior partner, the big boss. And, um, and I took clothes to get changed into and I thought, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do it. I'm You're going to go in I'm your... just going to stay as I am. Yeah. And we'll just see what, I'm not going to make a deal of it. And we'll just see what comes up. I never mentioned it. Great. So, so yeah, so I'm going to so start. So you're going to have to get him out of campaign. the suit and tie. Yes. Exactly. Start campaign, getting all healthcare <laughs> professionals. This should, I think all healthcare professionals should be able to and allowed to wear yeah. smart acting. You know, no, I don't wear, right. I don't wear totally luminous right stripes, but, no, but I wear just plain black, yeah. full length leggings, mm. um, a full a shirt with small sleeves. And mm -hmm. normally I'll have a, a zip up top mm -hmm. but yeah brilliant it's the nudge isn't it now the next thing that I want to talk to you about which I know that you are really involved with is talking about hormonal health mm. and the documentary that you did all about the contraceptive pill mm. which I thought was absolutely fascinating and I've been doing quite a lot of 
work and research, as you know, regular listeners will know, on HRT and and being you know very vocal about the benefits of estrogen for midlife women and beyond. But it was really interesting to hear your take and what you found, because like you, I'm very evidence based, mm-hmm. and I will I'm not a doctor, but I will talk to the doctors and I will go back and look through the medical literature and the studies and all the RCTs and the peer reviewed evidence and Nice and Cochrane and all of that. How did this documentary come about? And, and tell us a little bit about the background. Sure. So, um, so I'd worked with Horizon before, previously on a documentary. I don't know where the idea first came from. It didn't come from me. Um, but I was approached and went in for a meeting and we had a conversation about the contraceptive pill. And essentially what Horizon wanted to do and what the BBC wanted was a real investigative piece to dig down and take a really close look at the pill and identify the faults with it and, you know, the dangers and be thinking, you know, why in this day and age are women still taking this prehistoric form of contraception? Yeah. Um, So that was kind of the angle with which the researchers went in and started looking at all the newspaper clippings that have been around in the past about the increased risk of of cancer and and mood disturbance and blood clots. And so as much as the BBC wanted and we approached it from that point of view, the truth is the pill actually is a safe, effective, well-accepted, well-liked, very well-researched form of medication. It sounds very Um, similar to HRT. I I wish Horizon would do a a similar documentary on the supposed risks of HRT. Um, And yes, there are some risks, and Mm. those risks are more significant for some people than others. So, you know, as GPs, we have this whole booklet of how we assess risk, and combined oral contraception is not suitable for every woman. But if you're a woman who has no additional risk factors, and actually, it's, yeah. So it's the risk safe. factors are what? Let's give a top line on. Um, what so, you the, look so for. the risk factors. So the people who I wouldn't prescribe the combined pill for is a woman who has a personal history of breast cancer. So that's her herself, not her sister, her mother, her, her aunt, her grandmother. Exactly. But her. Her herself. Yes. If you know, if she has two sisters, her mum, and you know, if breast yes. cancer is, is is likely to be genetic, then we want to send her for genetic testing, probably. Mm-hmm. But then you know, we wouldn't probably wouldn't either. Um, and then everything else, it's a cum- cumulative thing. So anything that puts you at increased risk of something like a blood clot, if you add them together, then that, that risk gets much bigger. So things that increase your risk of a blood clot is being older, having a higher BMI. So being overweight. Being overweight. Mm. Being immobile. So say, for example, somebody who's a wheelchair user, it wouldn't necessarily be the best um, method because they've already got an increased risk factor. Um, And having high blood pressure. Right. Because, again, they're already at increased risk. Mm -hmm. And and apart from that, you know, if somebody doesn't have any of those... and Oh, and being a smoker. Right. Really important one. Um, If somebody doesn't have any of those, or sometimes if, if they've only got one of them, then... It's safe, but as soon as you have another risk factor, you start to get to the point where the risks and the benefits outweigh level out. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, you talk about combined pill mm-hmm. because they're a bit like HRT when you talk about the contraceptive pill, there's no yeah. one size fits all. How no. many different types of pill are there? Well, there's the combined pill, which contains estrogen and progestogen, and then there's the progestogen only pill. Um, but then within that, you've got loads of different types, so there are first generation combined pills, second generation and third generation. Um, now, when so, we made so, the so, programme, we had mm. them all. And I think there might have been something like, just talking about pills, there's about 23, maybe 23 different right. brands. And, and when pill. it started, how, how long has the pill been around? Um, since 1961, I believe. So it's approaching, it's approaching 60 years. Gosh, so it's very well tested. And has it changed much in that 60 years? Not that much. So what's changed as we've gone through those generations is, well, the first generation pill was just progesterone. Um, And then what's tended to change is that the dose of oestrogen has come down because they've found that with the lower dose of oestrogen, you can still get as good an effect. And the type of progesterone has, has changed. And it's actually the type of progesterone changing that is the biggest shift mm-hmm. in the second generation to third generation And do women pills. need both? Do they need need to have oestrogen and progesterone not to get pregnant? No. 
No, so which progest- is the bit that doesn't make you pregnant? The progestogen. It's both. Both east, east, well, it gets complex, but the progestogen on its own will prevent pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the estrogen and progesterone combined essentially doubly protects you against pregnancy. However, having said that, they're both deemed to be 99% effective if right. taken perfectly. The major difference when I'm prescribing estrogen combined or progesterone only for a woman who's sat in front of me, um, who doesn't have any risk factors, would be her personal preference because they behave slightly differently. So typically the way that the combined pill is used, well, historically, which is kind of incorrect, which I'll come on to, Mm. is you take it for three weeks, you have the pill-free window, and that's when you have your withdrawal bleed. So what's great about that is it's regular, you know when your bleed is coming, um, and it usually makes periods lighter. It can be helpful for people who have acne, whereas Mm. the progesterone-only pill or the mini pill you take continuously, and that means that you're less likely to have... Some women have no periods at all, um, we say I say period, but I mean withdrawal bleed when yeah. I say that's not actually true. So you period. take it continuously every day? Every day. Uh, usually means that if you do have any bleeding, it's much lighter, just spotting. Some mm-hmm. have no bleeding at all, but you don't know when it's going to come. So for some women, that's less convenient. And that's a progestogen only? That's progestogen only. And mm-hmm. that would be a preferred choice for women who have those risk factors. Yeah. Or for a woman who wants to start taking hormonal contraception straight after having had a baby. Mm-hmm. So... And then with all the other forms of contraception out there, you know, there are so many now that when it comes to choosing these days, there are lots of options Mm -hmm. for women. Yeah. Having said that, the vast majority still choose to go on the combined pill. To go on the pill. But your point about the documentary, and I think what I came away with having watched it, is that it's much safer than we have potentially been led to believe. Yes. Especially the the newer types of... Uh, hormones that are being used or, or the levels of potentially combinations of one of one of the things that really struck me um i think one of the most interesting bits of the documentary was around this pill scare in 1995 now i was 15 at the time and i was taking the combined pill for heavy periods mm. and i remember my gp ringing up saying zoe's got to come in immediately she's got to stop taking it. Now, I wasn't sexually active, so it was safe for me to stop taking it whilst yeah. this was all sorted out. And uh, and it was on the news, and it was like, these newer generation of pills have doubled the risk of the older pills. So it's twice the risk of getting a blood clot. They're really dangerous. So women freaked out and stopped yes. taking it, even though the public health advice was to continue. This sounds so much like the HRT story. No, it is. So, <laughs> so the media reported it as... Newer generation pills double the risk of the older ones. Now, strictly speaking, that was correct. But what had actually happened in this study was the risk that women had always been told about from taking the pill, the older pill, the risk we'd always shared with women, that was the same risk that the newer generation pills had. The risk was no more than it would ever thought it was. Mm. But this new study found that the older pills actually had half the risk of what oh, they previously thought. So instead thought, of reporting half the risk of the old pill, they decided to say it's twice the risk. Yeah. So um, so that's what happened. So yeah. it, le- it meant in the year following that, there was a 25% increase in births, presumably but because un- of women unplanned, not, unwanted, yeah. because women stopped taking their pill. And I think it was something like 6,000, no, 11,600, I think, um, additional abortions and the really yeah. alarming thing is when we think about the risk of a blood clot with the pill if somebody doesn't have any other risk factors the risk the increased risk of a blood clot it is an increased risk but it's very very small mm. when you're pregnant or in the months after giving birth the risk of a blood clot is about 2,000 times higher than it is from taking the pill so probably over that time there were more many, blood clots many more blood clots because yeah. women had stopped taking the pill because of this. But also, you know, what brain. infuriates me whenever I read a headline that talks about increased risk is you've got to look at, well, what was the risk to start with? Exactly. Because if the risk is one in 100,000, exactly. a headline that says, wow, it's twice the risk, yeah, okay, that's two in 100,000, or whatever it is. You know, I mean, it's it's still minuscule. People t- tend to think that they don't realise often, I think, that risk is not twice as likely or... Yeah. 
you know, it's not going to mean that one in two it's going to happen yeah. to. You've got to go back and say, well, what was the original risk? Yeah. And the other thing that struck me, which, I mean, we, we do know a little bit, I guess, about the risk or potential risk of um, blood clot or breast cancer or whatever, you know, low as it might be. But I hadn't realised that more significantly was the risk of mood altering mm. and poten potentially depression, yeah. particularly with younger girls. Mm -hmm. And we're obviously given a lot of messages these days about about mental health mm -hmm. and being awareness of anxiety and low mood depression. Yeah. And I mean, this is where when it gets into statistics and understanding what the data, not just what the data shows, but what the data means, it can be a bit of a minefield because mm. often we can take it to mean something that actually it doesn't. So to go back to the risk, you know, relative risk is very different to absolute risk. Um, the breast cancer that we featured in the show, that was a news article saying 20% increased risk of breast cancer if you take the pill. It's correct, 20% increased risk of relative risk. In absolute terms, what that means is out of 100,000 women, if 50 of them are going to get breast cancer anyway over the course yes. of a year, if they take the pill, then an additional 13 will out of 100,000. So that's so anyway. different, isn't it? I mean, a 20% increased risk sounds it massive. It sounds, sounds it. Whereas when you say an additional 13 in 100,000... Exactly. It's, it's like, very, well, very small. Tiny, tiny. And then also, to add to that, the taking the pill actually protects you, protects you slightly from colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. So when you put it all in together, the overall there is no overall increased risk of getting cancer from taking the pill yes. because they balance each other because out. Because you're going to be better protected. It's like oestrogen and HRT protecting against colorectal cancer. I mean, of it's course, very interesting. unless you've previously had breast cancer yes. or you have such a strong family history that you're yeah. already yeah, yeah, at increased genetic. risk. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so the study that we talked about when it came to mental health, mm. um, really interesting. So in... Um, I think it was Denmark, wasn't it? Was it Denmark? Yes. In Denmark, they have this database of health information. So everybody has a bit like an NHS number, but like a PIN number. And they can log what medication that particular person has ever taken from the pharmacy. We don't have that anywhere else in the world. So this study is a really important study. And what it found is that women who took the pill were significantly more likely to take antidepressants and even more significantly, more likely to have been suicidal or even committed suicide, especially young women in their Isn't late teens. interesting? What it doesn't tell us is that taking the pill caused their depression. Right. It could be that p women who are depressed are less likely to want to have children, so they're more likely to go on the pill. Possibly. It could be that women of a certain socioeconomic background are more likely to do both, whereas mm -hmm. women from a different background are like. So what we don't know, we don't have the cause and effect. We cannot say from that data mm. that taking the pill caused depression and that's why the person. But it's such a strong correlation yes. that we have to assume that that's a possibility mm. and we need to. And were there different dig down types deeper. of pill that were identified? Was it the progestogen only, or the combined, or was didn't, there a certain? Didn't actually. It didn't actually say. We didn't look mm. into that. That would be really pill. interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, it because was progesterone pill. does seem to be influential in mood and anxiety, either positively or negatively, and people are very sensitive to it, aren't they? They can react in different ways. Yeah. So they say the sort of more progesterone strong types of pill are more likely to give PMT type symptoms where they're more, more estrogen if they're gonna have side effects which can yeah. be the mood disturbance. Whereas the more estrogen heavy are more likely to give side effects that you might associate with being pregnant. So feeling bloated and, yeah. and um, problems with skin. So, so it's interesting, we don't know yes. the answer. The answer to that one is we don't know, but what, what we discovered from that bit of the film, which I think is probably the most, in terms of looking at the pill and mm. criticizing the pill, um, it's the most relevant bit that what we're seeing in Denmark is there's this really strong correlation between taking the pill and poor mental health. We did a big survey mm. as well, and we actually had a, I think it was about 25% of women reported um, a negative impact on their mental health from 
taken the pill, whether that was depression or anxiety. So it's not to be ignored. It's no. really sick. And, and, and this is ongoing. Are people looking at that now? Do you yeah. think a bit more? Well, they'll continue to look at the Danish study. What's tricky mm. with the pill um, is that you can't do randomised controlled trials because right. you no. can't have people taking placebo. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> you really pill. can't. <laughs> so... You know, it's tricky. You'd, yeah. you'd, almost, you'd almost have to do trials on women who, and yet they'd have to use another form of, of contraception. Or Yes. So it's a tricky one. So I'm not mm. sure how we get the answer to that. But I think the findings that are very clear from that is that any woman who is starting to take the pill and for anyone who's prescribing the pill, mm. it's really important to keep a, a mental health diary right. so that and to tell people around you because yeah. you might not notice to say to your mum or your sister or yeah. your boyfriend, yeah. I'm starting taking the pill, it can cause mental health problems. So Be aware. Be aware and let mm. me know if you think, mm. if you're concerned. And also not to be afraid perhaps to go back to your GP and say, I don't think this one's working for me. Never Is there afraid. another variety? I'm don't be saying. frightened that your GP is going to say, oh, well, let's take you off the pill then. You know, you can actually adjust it and say, can I try a different type or dose or combination yeah. and find something that suits me? 100%. I think that that was one of the things that I discovered is that women mm. sometimes don't feel they're allowed yeah. to come back to say, it's almost like, you know, oh, thank you for prescribing this. I'm really grateful. Oh, I'm not going to come and tell you that it it's made actually me work or feel terrible. Me, yeah, yeah. And of course, that's what we want you to do. There are so yeah. many different methods of contraception and so many different types of pill. Like, please give us the opportunity to help mm. you get it right mm. the other thing that i remember in that program was um is it right that it's all the fault of the pope that we have to take it with the week's break tell us about this how did the catholic church oh, get involved it's fascinating <laughs> so when the pearl first came around and it was this revolutionary lifeline yeah for for men and women yeah. um there was this clip from the archive that didn't make it into the documentary which showed this poor woman, you could tell that she she wasn't a wealthy woman at all. And she'd gone to see the health visitor and she had her four children under the age of six with her. Yeah. And she sees the health visitor and she says, I'm pregnant. And the health visitor goes, congratulations. No. And she goes, you could see in her face. No. Um, so it was revolutionary. It's staggering, isn't it, to remember that, that it was not that long ago not that when long ago. women really had very, very little control and very few options exactly. other than just having endless children yeah exactly um so but yeah so at the time when the first the pill first came to the to to the to the uk and i guess to the rest of europe um they were trying to it was the doctors they were trying to make it as acceptable to people to society as possible mm. and um, if you just run the pills together then you don't have a withdrawal bleed so by having a break, that creates this withdrawal bleed. They're like, great. So it seems like they're still having a period. So it seems really normal. And they felt that that would satisfy the Pope, that this wasn't interfering too much with, with the natural cycle. With the natural cycle. But that was the only reason. There was no reason to have the withdrawal bleed. There's no scientific reason. And actually, having that one-week break is the very thing that is responsible for a lot of the side effects. And also, the time you're most likely to get pregnant if you're taking the pill is when you, if you forget to restart the packet, the next packet. And of course, if you've just had a week's break, yeah, you're out of your little rhythm and routine. Yes. That's the pill and you're most likely hours. to forget. And that's the most dangerous time. So. so are you saying then that anybody who's taking any kind of contraceptive pill can just simply take it safely, continuously? I think and it's better. I think, you know, they should definitely check with their GP first. Um, because there are some women who we might not recommend that for. And, um, Such as? If, if a woman's been investigated for any abnormal bleeding or if there are any endometrial mm -hmm. problems, um, if somebody has PCOS, mm -hmm. then, th again, that might be... Some, she should she should def definitely have a conversation, but almost all women can just... Really, just take, just take it. it. But the, the manufacturers presumably know this, but they're going to have to start reformulating all their little packets. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking logistics here as somebody who used to be involved in, you know, making skincare products. Yeah. I'm thinking about factory lines and yeah. blister foil packs well, well, and not packing. And, no, of course not, because that. that's going to be very expensive yeah. to redo all of that machinery and yeah. logistics and labelling and boxes. And, and they're very happy because they're selling their product yeah. as it is. 
So, so therefore, and presumably, I mean, you know, think of all the, the tampon and sanitary pad manufacturers. Yeah. Because you then, you've got, I don't know how many women are on the pill, what the percent, percentage is, but presumably a significant number oh, yeah, of, yeah. during your childbearing years. Yeah, that's a lot of vaginal bleeding that, that is, is going to end overnight. Dis- but, you know, think of the, the benefit, the reduction in landfill, the cleaning of the waterways. Absolutely, Is this yeah. going to be a campaign? Well, the the scientist that we speak to, John Gilbo, say a scientist, he's also a GP, mm. um, he's kind of been on a bit of a mission for a long time and it's only now that everyone, that as doctors, we're, we're mm. hearing it. And even still, even though I spent half a day with him, mm. I still feel a little bit anxious yeah. saying to a woman, yeah, you can just run your pill packets together. I still feel this temptation to say, but just... Just twice a year, have a break, just to make really, sure that... just to make sure it's all working. <laughs> because it's... <laughs> because it just feels like... Especially because the guidelines haven't necessarily changed. So the not nice on the guidelines packet. haven't changed. What do nice say about it? I don't know, actually. It's a good question. I yeah, need to we'll check. Yeah, we'll look it up. Um, mm. That's a really good question. I don't know if the nice guidelines have changed. Um... But it means that you're then taking the onus, is it? And, you know, you're still yeah, thinking that... Yeah, as a like, GP, you're then responsible, aren't I you? I know this is right, but... What if? Because, you know, it's that first do no harm. If they're, yeah. they're taking the pill and they're okay and it's not a major issue. And so, but yeah, so things will change and it would be really helpful yeah. if the the drug companies would, would help us with that. Yeah, by making the packets yeah, that but little bit bigger. To any woman out there who is, you know, struggling with heavy bleeds whilst taking the pill yes. or who gets side effects around that pill-free break, whether it's breast tenderness or bloating or headaches. And it, and it was breast tenderness and headaches that John Gilbo said were the main two that can be caused by that sudden drop. By the withdrawal. In east, so estrogen. just carry on. Just carry on. And save yourself a fortune in sanitary pads. Just carry on. And, it's fine, just carry on. You know, worrying about not being able to, you know, I don't know, go swimming or have yeah. sex or whatever it is that's, yeah. you know blocking that week of your life each yeah. month because we've said it for, i mean for years we've sort of said to women oh, if you're going on holiday just don't take the pill for it just keep taking it keep and you won't bleed yeah. um but you, yeah you can just keep taking it how fascinating i so still look it still to makes me anxious saying it out loud but <laughs> you just keep taking it oh well please let's carry on talking about it now <laughs> i would like to finish with Looking at you, talk us through your, what's the day in the life of Zoe Williams? What does it look like? Do you, are you an early riser? Do you, no. do you eat a massive <laughs> breakfast? I mean, because okay. you look great and you're obviously doing the right thing in your life. So just, you. just chat us through what, what you do. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is there's no such thing as a day in the life. Yeah. Every day is different. Yeah. Um, but I'm not an early riser. I'm a lay in bed till the last possible minute. I'm a complete night owl. Yeah. Um, and it's it's genetic. All my fat. My brother is terrible. He can't get out of bed before eleven o'clock in, unless he really has to. Um, but both my parents are the same. So we're we're a night owl family. So getting out of bed is a struggle. So morning breakfast TV is not your favourite. Never. No, I'll stay in bed to the last possible minute. Get in, drag myself to the shower. Usually have something small for breakfast and a mm. cup of coffee, and then a second cup of coffee. Um, and then I, I'm even this person. I'll do my makeup in the car on right. the way to work, or on the bus, or on the tube, because that's an extra seven minutes I can have of sleep in bed. Um, snoo- I hate the snooze button. It's not very good. Um, it's one of the things I've really tried to address by having a strict bedtime and trying yes. to be in bed by eleven, even if I don't sleep. Yeah. But that's when I'm most productive. That's mm. when I'm if I'm writing an article. Mm. 11 o'clock at night your brain's just, going and it's yeah I know I what you just mean just do it yeah um, and then it just all depends on what I'm doing are you very strict day? about eating at the, at a set time are no. you into intermittent fasting or do you go for any particular types of foods do you exclude any foods no I eat I, I kind of I guess I follow when I've been asked this question in the past and I've thought well you know I don't really follow I've tried everything mm. mostly to see what it's like mm. out of intrigue not for any particular results. And if it's something I'm going to potentially recommend to patients, intermittent fasting probably being the one. Mm. Um, I've tried it. I've done low carb. I've tried keto. I've tried the caveman diet. Yeah. I've tried vegan. I've, I've tried them all, dabbled just for a few days. Um, but I guess my way of eating is probably the 80-20 rule most so closely. Where 80% of the time I eat very well and 20% of the time I eat whatever I want. And the way mm. I achieve that is... I don't have anything unhealthy in the house, really. I tend to, I like so to cook from scratch. and stuff. Yeah, I enjoy yeah. cooking. I love cooking. And mm. when I get the opportunity to do it, 
I'll do it and I'll, I'll free stuff. And so probably about 80% of the food that I eat is from my own home and it's healthy. Yeah. But if I'm going out for brunch with the girls on a Sunday morning, I'm, I don't choose a healthy option. I choose what I want. Sometimes that is the healthy option. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's burger and chips. Yeah. And, and I have what I want. So I never feel like I'm missing out. I read that one of your favourite breakfasts was poached eggs, avocado on sourdough, mm. which is mine. Too. Yes. So we, we share that. Yeah. And what with about a, gut with health? A, with a squeeze of lime and a bit of chilli. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm. That just brings it alive, doesn't it? Yeah. The lime on the avocado. Fab. Are you um, into fermented foods and, and kefir and kombucha, that so kind of stuff? Again, um, I'm not regimented about mm. it, but they're things that I, I'd like to do more. What I like about so, them is that you can add them in. You know, yeah. To your point earlier about not giving stuff up, adding stuff in. Yeah. It's adding so the goodness in. I forget sometimes and sometimes yeah. I remember. So sometimes if I'm, in the, if I'm in the supermarket and I see the kefir, I, like, I really like kefir. Yeah. I think I'll just have a little swig in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't used it in a way that I felt different mm. or, you know, I haven't used it methodically, but it kind of feels like, well, it's probably, mm. it might be a good thing for me to do sporadically. It's not going to do me any harm. Um, when it comes to gut health, the, from what I've learned in recent years, as we've been talking more and more about gut health, I've definitely tried to be more diverse with the plants that I eat. Yeah. And I often use shortcuts to, to achieve that. So I love buying those. You can get these like alfalfa sprouts and you get seven different varieties in mm, one little tub. Great. You know, with a sprinkle of that, that's seven different plants. Seven different things. Just Brilliant. a sprinkle on the salad. <laughs> I love it. Um, or, you know, the bags of, sort of because I'm often in a rush so if I'm going home I thought I'm just going to do a stir fry yeah. I'll get the vegetables that I really like I love pak choy I love bean sprouts I love a little bit of mushrooms but then I'll just get one of those bags you know where it's all been chopped all up mixed together and you put a handful a of that in and yeah. that's a really easy way to get more diversity or when you get the tomatoes the cherry tomatoes but you get three or four different types in one mm. packet so little hacks like that to try and increase yeah. the variety of plants that I'm eating yeah. but I love fruit I love veg that's I'm kind really, of lucky you're that fueled by it. I in, I enjoy eating fruit, but I enjoy colourful food. And then protein, presumably for fitness, do you do you focus on that? Do you make a conscious effort to think I need a bit of protein or good um, fats? I go through stages where I do, mm. and I definitely. When you were training, when you were doing gladiators, did you yes, do that? I did. Yeah, so definitely. If I'm if I'm trying to achieve something physically, and my, but my, I've always been very instinctive. I know if my body needs something it tells me, mm. I know that I need it. Um, so I guess nowadays, I don't really, I don't use protein shakes. No. I have I have done, in certain periods I have done. Mm. And I always have one actually, I always have a sachet in my gym bag, so that if I've got to rush somewhere straight after the gym and I can't eat anything, I can just whack that in a bottle with some water and have something. That's a great So I got kind of a, an emergency protein shake. Yeah. But they usually have about 200 calories in them. And I think I'd rather go over to Pratt and get a, an egg pot, and you know yeah. I'd rather eat my eat, calories eat food, in food protein. because yeah. I really enjoy chewing. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, Zoe, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank we you. could just carry on. There's so much to talk about, and I do hope that we connect again in the future. Thank you. I'll see you. I'll see you in the this morning studio. I'll hopefully. see you there on the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cute. And that's it for today's episode. As always, you will find all the links and resources mentioned on today's show over on the website, lizellwellbeing.com. There you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter, which is jam-packed with well-being wisdom, including easy at-home exercises and healthy recipes. Huge thanks to all of you who've left us such lovely reviews and feedback. It's great. And it really does help others to find the show. So thank you very much. And until the next time we chat, go well. Bye-bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with the production by Amaryllis Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With grateful thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.